well as pricing. Um, as well as the pricing could be a bit lumpy and a bit unreliable. So that got me reflecting on a program that I was part of in Western Australia, where we had cattle that needed to be grown out. So um, on the pastoral country up north, so in the Kimberley and Pilbara, we had farmers down south that had pasture and could keep stock going and moving forward in the traditional dry season up north where the stock would be traditionally losing weight. Um, and so that also, that not only kept the northern cattle going, but it also gave them diversity of markets because in northern Australia, all they had really was the live export industry. So it was a win-win. And so I thought, like, I guess by way of background, the way that that program was set up was that the pastoralists knew um, when they sent cattle down south, when they were smaller, they had a set rate, which was a per kilo weight gain. And the southern farmer knew that they had to put that weight gain on as otherwise they wouldn't get paid. But they also knew through experience and prediction what they would be able to be paid from um, those pastoral cattle coming down. So if they had good pasture, the cattle would put on, you know, between a kilo and a dollar, a, a dollar fifty, <laughs> a kilo and a half rather per head, and they were paid about a dollar fifty a kilo. So the pastoralists can go, well, you know what, I'm getting four bucks a kilo. If it costs me $1.50 a kilo to put on, I'm having a win, the southern farmer's having a win, and we're all sort of, you know, working together. Um, there were bonuses for both parties because the pastoralists could get the cattle off earlier and the southern producers had livestock and income when typically they wouldn't have had. So this also improved the southern producers' pastures uh, as because they saw the implementation of forage trees like Tagasasti um, and implemented that as part of their system, which not only gave them um, improved pasture utilisation, it also helped with the weight gain of the cattle. So this got me thinking about the grain producing side of things and the dairy industry. Um, dairy farmers need fodder and grain producers know how to grow good fodder. But there are a couple of things that needed ironing out. Um, and this is broad spectrum. I know that there's people that are doing this really well on both sides, but this was just to try and connect more people into this opportunity. Um, and so needing to understand things such as the quality requirements of the dairy industry and what's involved with growing fodder to a standard required to produce quality, consistent milk. We also recognise that it may be helpful for farmers to be connected with each other to build long-term relationships and establish these baseline prices for things such as happened in, over in WA. So the three main um, processes or the three main aims of this project, the first one is to develop relationships between dairy and grain producers so that they can come up with a price that may be the same or similar year in, year out. So sometimes the dairy farmers will get cheaper fodder than they normally would have. And sometimes they will have to pay more for it than they normally would have. Likewise, in some years, a grain producer may have received a higher, may receive a higher income if they were taking that crop through to grain, but other years they will do well out of cutting it for fodder and selling it at a higher price. Importantly, they'll have to cut it at the right time. So the quality will be high. Sorry, I've got mozzies in my office. Another aim is to help fodder and grain producers understand the impacts of quality for dairy farmers. So the haphazard nature of will I cut my crop now for hay uh, because it might have been frosted or it's not going to finish well means that dairy producers can get fodder which is higher in NDF, lower in energy and lower in crude protein. Now, if you don't know what NDF is, this program will quickly help you understand that. Basically, as the plant gets older, the plant gets higher NDF on nutri nutri neutral detergent fibre, um, and it's harder to digest, which also is directly related to the intake. So it's these quality pieces in the fodder which are really, really important for the dairy industry, and it's important for um, the, the, the exchange of knowledge to go both ways so that both sides of the supply chain understand the realities and the choke points, um, if you like, uh, around providing and supplying um, both ends of that. The third aim is to understand the practicalities around planting fodder specifically for the purposes of harvesting it. So what is the ideal planting rate and date? Uh, and how will this potentially increase the value of your soil? Um, and I saw that Cassie was on here and I was thinking 
total side note, but this could be a really good innovation project for the Cool Soils Initiative. There's another plug for project. Anyway, um, so we won't get involved in any of the pricing that goes on between farmers, but we will be facilitating meetings where you can explore your needs. Um, so we're going to get um, fodder or grain producers and dairy farmers around a table. We're going to explore the different parties' needs, that's economic and resource and quality wise. Um, and then we will step out and the magic will continue between those two. So in the WA scenario, which I gave you earlier, the whole thing was set up on a handshake deal and it is still going strong 15 years later. That has been through droughts, through wet years. So the power of this relationship building is through the commitment of making it work together and understanding the needs of each other and how to best achieve those needs so that everyone over the long term has a win. So trying to iron out the, you know, the highs and lows of forage pricing um, and you know, different climatic conditions through the seasons. So we will be holding workshops over the next 12 months. And for more information, you can contact Jane uh, and she'll be able to give you more information. So that's, that's just a little summary of the supply chain side of things that we're pretty excited about because I think it's a genuine value add uh, for both the dairy producers and the, and the fodder and grain producers. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thanks, Maz. Um, I know there's possibly a few farmers on board now that um, have experience in this relationship building um, exercise. Um, and as we said, this is something we'd really like to explore. So if anyone does have an interest in it, then they can um, email me and we'll keep you in the loop. And when we start those workshops, uh, we will let you know. Um, now, as Maz also said, you know, your soil health is a big determinant on the quality of your feed. Uh, so with this in mind, we know that in the northeast especially, uh, soil pH is a big uh, constraint in a lot of people's soils. And we know that um, maybe if some of the dairy farmers are beginning to grow um, fodder for themselves. They might not know what's below the surface. So we have um, Dr. Cassandra Schaaf from AgriSci on board, who's going to give a little bit of an overview on pH, how it will affect your fodder and take it away, Cass. Thank you, Jane. Great to see everyone today. It's, it's great that there's so many on board with this um, virtual field day. And it, as Maz said, it does suck that we can't be out in the paddock, which is where <laughs> we all prefer to be. But um, yeah, complete kudos to Replanes and uh, Murray Dairy and the other partners for pulling it off um, in a virtual form. So I guess we just go with the flow and do what we can. So as uh, as Jane mentioned, I've been asked to um, just just flag some what some of the constraints might be towards water production and um, linking in soil pH as a as one of the key drivers and well key drivers of productivity limitation I guess so one of the key constraints in our systems in northeast Victoria and southern New South and um, I know uh, there's there's some of you have heard me talk about um, soil pH and soil acidity before so for those it's a positive reinforcement uh, for others, it's, it might be a bit of an introduction, but please, um, you know, feel free to ask questions afterwards and if there's anything that you don't understand. So I guess, first of all, um, so yeah, so just to back up, um, for those who I haven't met, I'm a, a local soil scientist and um, have worked a lot with your plants and in the region. And it seems like everywhere I go and every project I work on, uh, soil acidity continues to be one of the key limiters in our systems. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's something that we all need to be aware of. All right, so <clears throat> very quickly uh, today, we'll just go through a 10 second overview of what soil acidity is, uh, work through looking at fodder crops and the tolerances, um, talk about the need for a helicopter view, or right, some people call it the 50,000 feet view of the system, and then looking at um, the cost of liming or well, the opportunity cost. So we're not going to go into the actual dollars um, at the moment because that's something that can take 
bit of time to work through, but there's some good resources that I'll uh, flick through to Jane to circulate as well in that respect. So basically, what is acidity? Um, well, we know that acid soils, um, which is, has a pH of less than five, is what we tend to call acidic. Uh, we know that in northeast Victoria and southern New South Wales, a lot of our soils are either naturally acidic if they're granite derived, and the, the rest of them are predisposed to acidity. So we have a lot of alluvial soils in our systems. And basically the rule is that assume that you've got acidity in your system and that your soils are acidic unless you've got proof otherwise. So that's probably a safe way to, to go about it in our systems. And when we think about what causes acidity, something we have to remember is that all forms of agriculture are acidifying because we have export re removal and we have fertiliser use. So as much as we like to think about um, operating in natural cycles and maintaining that kind of system, system flow in, in agriculture, the fact that we actually move material off farm by default means that we're acidifying because every product that we take off, it has a net high pH. So we can't help but cause acidification through ag. So that's, that's a bit of a bummer because we like to talk about sustainable agriculture and we like to talk about um, you know, how to do things in a way of, of capturing natural cycles. But the fact that we've disconnected from that natural cycle by taking something off the farm means that we need to account for what we take off. The other thing we know is that even though a lot of farmers in North East Vic have been liming, and there's good history of liming. And um, I used to work at the Victorian DPI at Rutherglen Research Institute, which actually uh, set up liming trials there, and I think about the 50s and 60s. So there's a really good history of, of lime use in the area. The challenge we have is that those historical lime, liming rates aren't adequate to keep up with our current um, biomass production. So grain, hay, meat, wool and milk, and the amount of fertiliser that we're applying. So even those who have had a really good lime history, there's a lot of those farmers who are now saying that they've dropped the ball in that they haven't um, increased their lime requirements to the same degree as they've increased their productivity. So just, um, yeah, so flagging, we talk about the role of nitrogen in soil acidification and just flagging where that acidity comes from in that process. So for those who are um, chemically minded, here's a bit of a geek out session for those who aren't. No stress. Um, basically what this little equation down the bottom is saying is that when we have ammonium coming into the system through our fertilizer and that's transfer, transformed through microbial activity into nitrite, which is the NO2 bit, and then into nitrate, which is the NO3, there's a net production or a net disconnect of hydrogen in that process. And hydrogen is the bit that causes acidity. So for every every unit of ammonium then there's ends up being four units of hydrogen that end up in the system and basically that's that's the whole connection between nitrogen and, and acidification so no big deal if it doesn't make any sense at all but for those who who wish to know that's that's where um it comes from and actual measurement of ph is literally a measurement of hydrogen in the system so when you talk about um acidity and alkalinity um, when we're measuring acidity that's the amount of hydrogen in the system and alkaline systems have a lot of hydroxide so it's H or OH whichever way you go but just yeah when we measure pH it's, it's a measure of per hydrogen which we're measuring in our soil systems anyway but the key reason why soil acidity is such a, a bad deal for our ag systems is the fact that when we get acidity and get low pH values we get a lot of aluminium coming into solution and that's the kicker that tends to limit our productivity. So all soils have heaps of aluminium in them. So aluminium is actually the third most common element in the Earth's crust. It's everywhere and it's fine. But it's only when we hit those low pH values that that aluminium in our soils moves into a form that becomes toxic to plant roots. And it's toxic to the roots because that aluminium can move into the root tip. And as that root tip is growing, it actually changes how those cells divide and grow, which means that we get um, cell mutation, which causes stunted root, root growth and malformed root tips. So otherwise known as root pruning or, or club roots. And this is it at a, um, a microscope scale. 
So as I've talked about in Northeast Victoria, assume you're acid unless you know otherwise. And that's demonstrated by a heap of um, soil sampling that's been done in the region last few years as part of the Cool Soil Initiative, which um, demonstrated that even just over about 240 paddocks in Northeast Victoria, over 82 of those um, had pHs less than five. We know pH of five is about where we start to, to run into trouble as we get below that. We also know that um, a lot of cropping farmers tend to be quite proactive with lining. So this is probably on the better end of the scale as far as our, our landscape goes. And this also assumes that um, the pH values that we're measuring are uniform in that top zero to 10 centimetres, which we know generally isn't the case. So this is a very conservative view. There's a chance that the actual, um, those that are experiencing acidity is actually going to be higher again. Because we know that if you have a history of lime and you have a history of good productivity, we can actually end up with quite high levels of pH, with quite high pH values right at the surface. We get that because mostly in our no-till systems, we've been broadcasting our lime. And so we end up with this accumulation on the surface. And any plant litter that falls on the surface as well, we know that that will contribute to a high pH value. So what we find in our no-till systems is that over a 10 centimetre depth, we may be going from 7.5 at the surface all the way down to 4 or 4.3 at 10 centimetres. But because our sampling method is 0 to 10, when we mix that all up together, it ends up about pH of 5.5, which you look at that and you go, sweet, happy, no problems at all. Then you try and grow a, 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 an acidity um, susceptible crop like, um, like a legume, bombs out, and they go, well, my pHs are fine. I don't know what the problem is. Bloody legumes, not growing that again. So they're not really realising what the, what the key limiter is that you're dealing with. And so when you look at that, you think, well, your, your seed may be placed around here and um, your rhizobia is trying to inoculate down here, which is, which is not gonna, gonna work. So just flagging um, stratification or layering of pH is a really big deal in our systems. And we can actually test that in the field just by using a pH kit from Bunnings. Um, it really irks me that the Manutech brand from Bunnings is actually one of the best around. So in this case, Bunnings is the best value. So um, grab one of those tests, they're not very dear. And um, yeah, just, just follow the instructions and see how you go. Now just flagging, these tests and the measurement on them is about equivalent to pH in water. Now we measure pH in calcium chloride with all our soil testing. So knock off about 0.8 to a unit and um, you'll be about equivalent. So this is just demonstrating the, um, <clears throat> the drop that can happen with depth. So if we think about uh, fodder crops or forage crops and how they look like in terms of their pH tolerance, we know that there is some variance. So depending on how acid your soils are, you'll be able to grow different types of crops. So if we're just thinking about our winter fodder crops, we can see that um, yes, our brassicas, such as canola and that, are, have less tolerance to acidity, um, and then oats being one of the most tolerant crops that you can get. Don't worry too much about this end of the scale because there's not a lot of detailed information around at what high pH values things start to bomb out at. So just um, recognising that there is a range in pH values down to which you can grow these crops well. But that's not the whole story. Um, because even with our legume crops, even though uh, vetch has a pH tolerance down to five and lupins you can actually grow down to about 4.8, that's fine. And you can still get a really great bumper crop of lupins growing, but most of the rhizobia which inoculate those those plants and which capture the nitrogen from the atmosphere for that plant to use can't function below about pH of five. So the trick is that you might be able to grow the plant, but without the rhizobia functioning. And that means that all that plant's doing is capturing nitrogen from the soil, just like every other plant does. So you can't, um, you can't assume that you'll get a nitrogen benefit back from that, that crop afterwards. So that's the rhizobia issue, and that's a really big deal. And I know that some of the work that Kate's been involved in with Group Lanes and others through the uh, Victorian Pulse Program has actually been looking at selections of rhizobia that are more pH tolerant, which is great. But end of the day, it's, it's 
it's a there's a bigger issue that you need to deal with as well. So that's the rhizobia, but we also know that other bacteria don't function well at low pH either. So bacteria, and down at the bottom here, there's a table with a range of pH values for different types of microorganisms. And just the key focus here is bacteria, you know, pH of five to nine is about where they sit. So as you go below five, even bacteria like the nitrifying bacteria, which is the ones that convert, convert the organic nitrogen to mineral nitrogen for plant use, they don't function well either. So you can't assume that you're getting any value from your soil mineralization. So I normally assume in crop mineralization about 50 kilos or more, um, but those assumptions can't be made under those low pH systems. We also know that a lot of other nutrients are poorly available. So phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, molybdenum, and others, um, they're not going to be available for plant use much. So you can apply it, you can still put more on, but the plant won't be able to pick it up. And we also know that we can't build organic carbon under these low pH values. So just demonstrating, as everyone knows, the importance of inoculation of rhizobia for, um, in this case, uh, clover, subclovers to grow. And at those low pH values where we can't get that inoculation, then we're going to get a yield penalty. So when it comes to winter fodder crops, um, size does matter in that um, hay production has the largest effect on acidification because you're physically growing a lot of mass that's been removed. So we've got, um, and the other challenge we have is that we grow hay, we've got a higher acidification rate per tonne of product and we have more tonnes. So it all kind of compounds. So what we've got here is, we call it your typical acidification rate um, per kit as kind of calculated for the kilograms of lime per hectare that you'd need to apply to offset the acidity. So this is really a lime requirement or lime offsetting graph. So example of how to read it is that um, if we look at export oat and hay, we've got 25, a measure of 25. That means that per tonne of oat and hay removed from the paddock, you need 25 kilograms of lime to offset that removal. So if we um, if we run some, whereas loosened hay is is massive, so that's up to 70. And the reason why loosened hay is so massive is because you've got that nitrogen component there as well. Um, so a lot of biomass, um, you've got a lot of uh, nitrogen being taken away with the product as well, and the effect of that on the, on the soil. Whereas if we look at our grains, uh, wheat and um, wheat and canola are quite low and even milk and wool and meat, every kilogram of them that you take off the paddock, that's also taking off high pH product. So everything you take off your farm, you need to offset that with lime requirement. So just to run what, an example of what this looks like in terms of calculation, with the oat and hay of a measure of 25, if we look at about an eight ton per hectare oat and hay crop, then that would require 200 kilos of lime per hectare to offset that. Uh, whereas in comparison with wheat grain uh, with a measure of nine, it's about 45 kilos. So we know that if you're taking fodder off, then that's, that's a big deal. So just for kicks for those who are interested in the full system around um, not just the export product, but also what that means with the, the fertilizers that you've used and their, their potential to acidify. If you look at our eight, oat, oat and hay crop of eight tonnes, and we've put on 80 kilos of MAP and 100 kilos of urea, the total lime requirement per hectare then is um, over 300 kilos. So it doesn't take much for that to start to add up over time. And the other thing is that doesn't include any in-crop grazing export. So if you've grazed your oat crop, um, if you've done any in-crop grazing, even if, with wheat, if, um, with your winter, winter varieties, if, if you put the sheep in, eating it out and then you let it, um, you lock it up and grow it for hay, this doesn't take into account that additional requirement with that. So the other thing to think about is what we call the helicopter view. So um, I was asked to, to kind of look at the, um, the fodder crop acidity story, but in actual fact, it's really just part of the whole system. 
And so we need to look at that whole system in order to make it make sense. So this, this is really just demonstrating that as we increase our pH values, we've got a lot of options with what crops we can grow and what systems we can, we can work in, which is awesome. So that gives you diversity. It means that you can um, respond to markets or um, paddock conditions and um, herbicide resistance and anything else that you have to deal with. As your pH de decreases, the amount of the types of crops that you can grow also decreases. So what that means is you're actually reducing your options and it's increasing the vulnerability of that system to risk. So it means that you can't respond to that and say, well, I want to grow um, a legume crop um, or have a good mixed mix pasture system or loose and high or anything like that because you've, you've kind of cut yourself into a corner. So that's one thing and that's a real opportunity cost of what you can't do with that land because it's acidic. But the other thing that doesn't tend to come into the calculations or assessment of, of cost of acidity is that even if you can grow a crop at low pH, even if you can, you can bang out a trit, you know, triticale oats and oats and maize or, or whatever, you've got a few things going on. What we don't tend to think about is that at those low pH values, we also have very poor nutrient efficiency. So you may be putting on your 80 kilos of MAP, but you're only getting access to five. Um, so your, your ability of the plant to be productive and grow at its um, yield potential is limited. The other thing that's coming out now, and it's still a bit anecdotal, but it's consistently coming through, is that at low pH values, we're getting crops with a high disease and pest pressure. So it's the plants that are already stressed due to acidity that are starting to demonstrate higher levels of disease and pests. So your, your cost around um, crop protection then increases as well. The other thing is the, the low pH areas are the ones that we're going to see those high weed pressures coming through. So again, your, your cost of, um, of herbicides may be increasing as well. So it's, when we think about acidity, we tend to just think about the cost of lime. We don't tend to think about what the cost is if we don't put that lime out. So, so what can we do about it? Um, I'll keep the stuff on here. Um, I'll be sending this out as a PDF to Jane and, and happy for this to be circulated and, and do whatever you like with the project. But the plan is, is that you need to commit to a plan in terms of either sampling your whole farm at every few years or, or setting or at a set point in your rotation. GPS located sampling is completely important and measure your pH and your cation exchange capacity, which is your CEC. And that determines how much lime you need to add to bump up your, your pH levels to a certain amount. If you've got a history of broadcast lime and no-till, then five centimetre increment sampling will give you a lot better accuracy to understand where your lime is in your system and where your acidity is. Then you need to understand what your soil conditions are. So where is your depth of acidity? Do you have any sodic layers? Do you need any gypsum? What's your slaking potential in terms of trafficability? Dig a few holes, have a look, check out your Bunnings test kit, see what you can find. Keep your line rates high and make them aligned to your current kind of exchange values. So don't try and cover the whole farm every second year. Just put, take your same budget and put more line on less area less often. So I'm not saying you need to spend more on line, I'm just saying that you need to concentrate that line to an area to do it properly, and then next year move to somewhere else. So you then need to choose the right machinery because you do need to incorporate. And it may be that the machinery in the shed isn't the right gear for what you need for your soils. So don't just immediately think it's cheaper if I just grab the disc that I've got. It may be a, a lot more expensive than long run if you screw it up and do a bad job. So the, message here is that we do need to incorporate our lime. So if you run a pasture system, then make your lime count by putting it on when you're starting to a pasture reno phase, where you come out of your pasture into cropping. If you run a no-till system, plan your, rotate, plan your incorporation at a point where it's going to have best value within the system. So it might be after you've finished, um, you've done a, multiple cereals together, or it might be you know, before you go into canola to ensure that your establishment isn't compromised by high stubble loads. 
choose a point where it's going to have the most bang for your buck and then plan it to account for the fact that you'll have a softer seedbed and likely poor traffic ability afterwards. So try and get this done as early as you can and then look to plant early in the season so that your plants are off and going before it gets wet and cold. <clears throat> and just a bit tongue in cheek that um, Lyman Corporation keeps the no-till dream alive, which seems a bit of an oxymoron. But uh, if we don't do this once in a while, then no-till is, is not going to, to work for the rest of the time. Just flagging that there is in paddock variance, so it's important where you sample and just keep track of where you sample so that you have a monitoring point to come back to. And this will be part of you see it just demonstrating that um, yeah, different parts of paddocks can have very different values and these values can change with depth as well. So the key things to consider is assume your soils are acidic unless you have evidence otherwise. Don't fairy dust it. Apply what you need, incorporate it and walk away and go back to no-till. Consider the lime as a capital investment to return value and we know when we do it well, we get return that first year. Whereas we know with broadcasting, it used to take several years before it had any benefit. If we incorporate well, you'll, get, you'll, you'll start getting money back in that, in that next crop. Different soils can tolerate different machinery. So don't just go with what's in the shed. Think about is that the right thing? When we talk about the opportunity cost of not fixing soil acidity, um, we're talking about limited land use options, continuous decline in productivity, nutrient availability and decline in soil carbon. And once that lime is applied and you've spent the money, then ensure that other factors such as your nutrients aren't limiting. So you're looking to then, once you've done your incorporation at a, at a decent rate of lime, then set up your, your farm and your, your crop to maximise that growth and yield potential. So if you're going into a fodder crop afterwards, then feed it what it needs to um, get the job done, knowing that you've taken that pH out of play in terms of the constraint. And that's it. So I'm happy to send that PDF around. And um, yeah, if there's any, happy to answer questions now and, and any follow up ones as well later. Great, thanks, Cassie. Um, as I said, if anyone's got any questions throughout the presentations, put them in the chat and we'll, we can answer them. Um, but before we continue, did anyone have any questions? Cass, I know there's a lot of information there and when we start talking about the pH story it can get really quite um, scary <laughs> but it is very real and I guess one thing to say is you know it's very applicable um, especially for this project when we um, when we sowed the crop and then we did a soil test and mm, yep it's um it can see that it hasn't had the love that it needs in the past. Um, and it's probably the reason that the vetch is not thriving as it should. Um, so yeah, if anyone, any questions quickly? Cass? Yeah, that's a good question, Sophie. So when we think about the Silage is a bit harder to deal with because we're dealing with a wet product, but it's probably almost equivalent. So we're talking about you know an eight ton oat crop, hay crop. If that was a silage crop, we might be talking about 20, 20 ton. So we, we know that um, we take off a lot bigger mass of weight of material with silage, but because a lot more of it is water, it also kind of comes back to the same amount. So. Um, the, the fact that you're, if you take it for hay or silage, you're still taking off the same biomass. You're just taking off um, with hay, you're waiting a bit longer till the, the moisture contents come to, come back a bit. So I'd say that um, work on basic equivalency for silage as for hay. A good question. And just something I wanted to flag as well, um, just because I haven't given you enough information today, is that um, the testing for pH and stuff doesn't have to be super expensive. So I know that the cost of soil testing can tend to put people off. And we know that um, when we send a test to the lab, that you know we could be looking at 80, 80 to $100 for that test. 
which is, you know, you just think, well, that's, that's a lot of money. Do I need it? Every, every once in a while, doing those comprehensive tests is really good value to check where your basic nutrient status is through property and just check that basically a general health check to make sure that everything's tracking well. But you might just want to do that every few years and in the meantime, or in addition to, just to measure pH and CEC is very low cost. Um, I think we're talking, oh, I can't remember, Jane, it's about 15, 12 to 15. Uh, might be 20. Yep. Up 20. Yeah. So let's say upper cost 20 bucks per test. So when you, when you think of it like that, then it's, it's not a big, it's not a big cost to give you the information that you need to make the, the best decision that you can in terms of your economics, um, and working out how much lime that you need to apply. And then uh, finally, there's some really cool stuff coming out of uh, New South Wales DPI now around what target pHs we need to aim for. And if we have a risk of subsoil acidification, then I to say this, but the target pHs we need to be looking for is up to 5.8 in our surface, rather than 5.2, which used to be our target pH values. At 5.2, we're maintaining our surface pHs, but our subsoil acidity can continue to increase. At pH 5.8, we're actually improving our subsoil pH values as well. So that's something to think about. And finally, um, this is work that we're um, continuing through roof planes. And um, there was some fields, uh, the, there'll be a field site being established over summer looking at um, acidity in the region and the role of incorporation in, in managing particularly subsoil acidification. So I'll leave that to Jane and, and Maz and Co to, to talk about some other time, but just flagging it. This is all, all go. Great. But, Thank you, um, Cassie. Oh. That's okay. That's <laughs> a question. Uh, best option for lime incorporation, pH remediation, loosen, given no incorporation options. If you're looking at um, maintaining that loosen stand for another couple of years, then a, a broadcast would be better than none at all. It would keep keep some maintenance in the system. So I'd, you'd be looking at, um, look, I can't give a rate because I don't know what the soil type is, but you know, broadcast is, would still give value compared to nothing at all. But then when you come out of that loosen, um, that's when you really need to um, invest into that and get it, make sure that it's uh, top of its game and game. But that's one of the reasons why uh, loosen can uh, not persist as well as you think it should in some systems because that acidity is actually um, causing it to be under, under stress. So. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Cass. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge that the Northeast, Cassie was able to present today alongside our FODA for the Future project, while well, it's all intertwined, thanks to the Northeast CMA um, through some funding provided by the um, Australian Government's National Land Care Program. <laughs> now I'd like to show you a little video um, so we can all see the site and the video, <laughs> I don't like to watch it because it's got myself in it, um, <laughs> produced by from Murray Dairy. So this should give you a little bit of a overview of the, oh, hang on, of the site. Now let me just share my screen it's um no I'm the one having troubles I share Okay, now I'll go back to the start. It's disappeared on me.
There's no sound, Jana. Oh. Oh, because, hang on. We've still got no sound. Well, I don't. Others might. You might need to unplug your uh, headset, Jane. Well, she can't hear us either. And um I'll try again. Here. Um, when you share, there's a button generally on your Zoom settings that means you can um, hear the, audio, the video, but you have to push a button, a particular button to share with your computer vo audio. Do you know where that button is, Kath, to help Jane? Um, yeah, I do. It's different for Zoom and Teams, yeah. just a sec. No. We might be better <coughs> for the video to everybody, Jane. means that weed control options are limited. So now we can't spray out these weeds without... It's actually working now, working Jane, now. If, you <laughs> the, really if you want to go back to the start, it's working. Site, that we have the ability to really show the effect of... Do people want to go back or they've seen the site, that's probably enough, and I'll forward the video. Just got okay. a great big grey box at the front of it so we can't actually see the crop. Sowing date and sowing oh. rate and all the issues and problems that we've had along the way. We so it. we know that we've got weed issues. We know that at mid-August there's a real difference in growth for the oats and the vetch in both timing and the rates. Therefore, Jane, we and do our it go back to the start. So can everyone see it properly now? No, there's a big black screen, um, big back blocks right across the screen. Oh, it's not in mine. So how about we get rid of that? <laughs> that worked well. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what was going on, <laughs> but hopefully you saw at the end a little bit of the paddock. Did you see any of the paddock? No. Oh. Okay. Well, I will hand over to now <laughs> to Luke Nagel from Advanced Ag. So Luke is an agronomist um, and deals with a lot of the dairy industry. And Luke will just um, give us a bit of a a snapshot on the best ways agronomically to grow a good fodder crop. All right, thanks, Jane. Hopefully everyone <laughs> can hear me there. All good. 
Hear me okay? Yep. All good. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me involved in today. It would have been nice to be wandering around in the beautiful weather we've got, but here we are sitting on Zoom, so that'll have to do. Um, just to let people know, I'm an agronomist for Advanced Ag, which is based in Shepparton, uh, which is the Golden Valley, and uh, I work throughout this area with dairy and broadacre clients. Uh, so today I'll give you a, an overview of what dairy operators prefer in a forage crop. So I'll just load up um, something on the screen here. All right, so basically uh, the purpose of a quality silage and hay crop. So for the cropping enterprise, we're looking at um, potentially a break crop. Uh, it can also be a crop rotation tool while ma maintaining a relationship with a dairy business. Uh, it could be for weed control. It's a good way to get rid of a bit of ryegrass. And uh, also bonus of nitrogen fixation from a legume such as, as the, uh, the vetch. And for the dairy enterprise, uh, it's a good source of protein and chasing digestible fibre also as say a straight cereal. So in terms of what species we want to plant, the majority of uh, dairy operators are chasing protein over say energy in board in feed. Um, therefore, like the image you see there on the right of the screen, the dominance of vetch with some cereal is a preferred product. Uh, this paddock here is in the Kyabram area. It was planted during early May. It didn't really get away until about the 20th or 25th of May on the autumn break through our district. It was probably a bit earlier back up Rutherglen Way. It was sown to Morava vetch, 40 kilos a hectare, and septa wheat at about 15 or so kilos a hectare. So pretty light, but it's tilled quite well. Same with DAP at 100 a hectare, and the vetch seed was inoculated with uh, a dry peat inoculum called Tag Team. Um, in terms of what you sow, there needs to be that communication between the grower and the prospective buyer prior to planting, if there is that relationship at the start. And if in doubt for the grower, steer towards growing a protein product. That's where the money is for later. Uh, in terms of um, yeah, in terms of sowing rates, so a common question I do get is, what do we plan at what rate? So those um, sowing rates can vary a bit depending on the district. I think if you've got plenty of moisture at the start, you'd continue with your 40 or so of vetch to the hectare. Uh, if you're using popney vetch, which is a slightly smaller seed, you'd probably back the rates off a little bit, maybe by 10 or 20%. Uh, and the cereal, we tend to keep pretty low if we've got a good bank of moisture at the start, uh, tend to bump the rates up a bit to 20 or 30 kilos or even more per hectare. If it looks like a dry year and a dry start, because to get some yield, you won't get lots of yield out of vetch in a dry year. It's got to come from the cereal. Um, yeah, and common varieties of vetch that we do use in the Golden Valley. Uh, Morava, which is a quicker type, and Popney Vetch, which is probably the premium for hay, and it comes at a higher price too, typically, most years. And as I said earlier, the optimal plant time in the Golden Valleys tends to be during May and not much later, and probably not a lot earlier either, to um, maximise quality at the other end. Uh, in terms of paddock selection, Avoid stony paddocks where possible, especially if you know the dairy farmer is going to roll up with a silage chopper. Uh, you can't get rocks through the choppers. Uh, consider a forage crop to aid in weed control. Soil test every three to four years as a general rule. Again, just in th things terms of uh, lime and phosphorus and everything else that comes with it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, keep the cereal rate up if it looks like a, it's a dry start and looks like a forecast dry year. Um, and that's to keep your tonnage up for later, that is. To, if it was 
pure vetch, for example, in a dry year, you tend to not get much off it at all. You probably won't put a mower blade through it. So it's good to keep the cereal rate up a bit. Uh, avoid planting wheat and vetch into a broadleaf dominant paddock, such as cape weed. So cape weed's really hard to get out of vetch. Although there's a new product, a chemical product on the market called Reflex, uh, which is available for a lot of different pulse crops, including vetch as a legume. Uh, it's good at keeping out, um, let's run through the weed spectrum for you. So it's about $20 a hectare, Reflex. Good at keeping out fumitry, milk thistle, wireweed, volunteer canola, crassula, shepherd's purse, radish, uh, dead nettle. Uh, pretty good on flea bane and prickly lettuce. So um, that's just for straight vetch though. You can't have the cereal in there with it. So if you're looking at straight vetch and you've got a, a moderately broadleaf weed issue, uh, that's definitely an option to use some reflex at $20 a hectare. Um, what else have we got there in terms of... Yeah, and sorry, insect issues. So consider previous insect issues for preventative management, such as slugs, earth mites, and loose and fleet, uh, more so on the vetch, that is. So next screen, we've got uh, so post sowing management. So we've got the crop in the ground. It's pretty well just up and away out of the ground and um, early pest control. We, as, as we said, loose and flea, earth mite tend to be the major problem in vetch. So we can be preventative with that, with the uh, uh, products such as like a Pyrenex Super, which is a chlorpyrifos and um, bifenthrin type product, uh, or even just as simple as a bifenthrin through earth mite, which is commonly called Telstar. Uh, consider rolling the seed bed if required with say a steel roller. If it's sown with a system such as a knife point press wheel, where you get those ridges in between your drill lines. So just so you can get that mower through it later as low as possible. Um, so weed control options, options, we did mention just reflex uh, with straight vetch for broadleaf weeds. Other options we've got in vetch and wheat and vetch and oats, for example, if you grow popney vetch is um, broad strike. The group B herbicide can go over popney to take out mainly um, marshmallow and shepherd's purse, for example. Um, another, what I call a salvage option, and especially at an old, typically an old dairy farm where you get lots of uh, marshmallow and nettles, is there's a product called EcoPar. It can be put over cereal and vetch at around six to 800 mils a hectare. It's quite expensive, 30 to $40 to the hectare, but it's good salvage product to take out nettles and marshmallow that could almost yeah, swallow up the crop. Uh, and the other weed control option we've got that a lot of the cropping guys would be keen on if they're trying to clean paddocks up with ryegrass is glyphosate over the crop around three to five days before cutting for silage or hay, typically for a hay situation. Um, consider nitrogen, nitrogen application. So the vetch will tend to make its own nitrogen. Um, but if you add more nitrogen, that will chase more yield, especially on the cereals. Uh, with disease prevention, so we're trying to prevent disease and not cure it as we do with most crops and disease. Uh, typically going out with a fungicide to, for the wheat but, and more so the vetch, uh, canopy closure. So there's plenty of different fungicides available that are registered on vetch. Just got to watch withhold periods for late application. So from about this time of year, so we're in uh, early mid-September, just watch what products you're using. Some of them have got four to six weeks withhold. And if you're on irrigation, um, yeah, like most crops, irrigate while there's still a reasonable amount of moisture in the ground. Don't let it get stressed and then water. Uh, so in a year like this on the irrigation, there's a fair bit of water rolling out already in the Shepparton and west of Shepparton where we I mean, lucked out on a bit of 10, 15 mil instead of 30 or 40. So yeah, there's a fair bit of water going now on, on flood and pivots. In terms of um, moving on into late September, October, potentially even November for silage and hay, uh, we've got to make that decision of hay or silage, which 
potentially was decided at planting time if there's a relationship between the broadacre operation and the dairy business. So David Lewis will talk more on timing and what he's chasing, but in terms of cereal vetch silage, so these could be oats or wheat in with the vetch, it's usually harvested at the boot stage. So just before that head pokes out of the stem, which it will emphasize the protein more so and not in terms of uh, yield, you probably, you won't gain as much yield, but you'll maximize protein taking it off at that stage. That's the true product of what the dairy farm is after is that protein product. Uh, and that's probably going in at around about 35% dry matter, so 65% of that's moisture going off the paddock. Uh, as you progress a few weeks later, weather warms up, you're then considering your cereal vetch hay, which is usually cut at early head emergence. Um, that early head emergence is allowing for maximum protein still, but the head out of the stem is allowing for um, the ease of curing. So such as say export oat and hay, for example, most of it's cut once the head emerges. So then that's the ease of curing is there compared to the head being still stuck in the stem. So as I mentioned, David Lewis will talk more on those timings and what we're chasing in terms of NDF, protein, energy. So in terms of the, the big one this year is costs. So if you can see all that across the screen there, um, basically this is based on hay. This is, so not solids, I'm talking hay tons. We could talk dry matter tons, but I don't want to confuse you too much. So in terms of hay, hay and where it's all at this year, and with high commodity pricing this year of wheat and canola, the silage and hay option is probably not very attractive to the cropping industry. Uh, you can see the numbers across the far right there of what it, what it actually costs to grow a tonne and put it in the shed. Uh, and you look at the yield per hectare, um, there's a lot more money in wheat and canola this year. But as we said earlier in the day, it's, it's a year by year um, progress with wheat and uh, relationships with, with dairy farmers. So it is, a, I suppose, a long-term set up in terms of how you want to approach it. Uh, so the re basically the reasons for a cropping enterprise to supply into a dairy this year where the prices are, uh, it may be to maintain a relationship. Uh, if the crop is frosted, probably more so a straight wheat crop, maybe in the next, in the next month, like September is the money month, it can be um, boom or bust. So hopefully we don't get smashed with the frost in the next few weeks. And also it could be for a, a crop rotation, clean up of a grass weed paddock. So it could be just something that fits into someone's program. So you can see through there, these costs might match to what everyone would work on. So planting costs might be more of a contract rate with an air seeder. Summer spray is just allowing for a knockdown during the guts of summer, uh, seed and inoculant. So your cereal and vetch and a bit of inoculant is covered in that. Sowing fertilizer, so DAP or MAP at a thousand bucks a ton, which is about where it is now. So that's probably pretty true, that number. Uh, knockdown pre-em and insecticide at sowing, potentially a bit of nitrogen going out there during this year. So that's probably allowing for Oh, yeah, 100, 150 kilos urea, uh, fungicide in crop in July, August. And as we mentioned earlier, a pre-harvest glyphosate three to five days before the mower goes through just to finish off ryegrass plants so they don't regrow after the hay cut and um, set seed. So you can see rough cost per hectare, probably contract rates there for cut rake and bale and a bit of cartage. And you can see down that right-hand side, if you grew five tonne of hay a hectare, it's gonna cost you about 150 bucks a tonne to grow it. So if you sell it for 200 bucks a tonne, you've only made $250 a hectare this year. So not a lot compared to a couple of tonne of canola a hectare at seven or 800 bucks a tonne minus um, cost. So um, yeah, some numbers to consider there. We can yeah, share this screen later or we'll forward it through if you want some of these numbers to yeah, work on for later. So yeah, thank you. And if, there, if there's any questions, yeah, go ahead and ask a few. 
Great, thanks, Luke. Um, we might go straight into David Lewis just because he follows you so well with his silage and hay selection. And then at the end of David, we might have questions for you and him together, if that's okay. all right. Okay. Um, so I'd just like to introduce David Lewis. David uh, has years of experience in the silage and the hay industries, um, both in the market area and on the ground, um, and currently with Lalamund. So David, if you can Welcome. Hear me. Yes. Yeah, right. Great. So thank you everyone for giving us the field day online. Uh, I'll just uh, see if we can have the sharing capability and get into it. So should be in full screen mode, correct? Yes, correct. Right, -o. now we're good to go. So thank you everyone and thanks Luke, for your, you've set me up nicely and done half the job for me. Uh, so some good points in there that I'll, I'll reinforce and uh, I wasn't gonna, going to go into in-depth silage making, it was just a bit of high level stuff on the silage making. A couple of things to think about, a little bit more about what Luke spoke about on the getting the the mix right for the target market, the end, end, end use in the animal, etc. Uh, so why would we make silage? Well, the key objective of silage is, is producing a, a volume of highly palatable, waste-free feed that we can store for a long time. So silage is a fermented feed. It can store you know, close to the feed values of the parent crop that we cut, if we follow the, all the steps and manage it well. So it's a great source of readily digestible nutrient and, and fiber for, for ruminants. Uh, and we can use that source to increase the, the density in our feeds. As we intensify our feeding systems, we can increase the, the nutrient density of those systems. So we can you know, manage that diet to increase our animal performance. So particularly dairy where forages can be 50 to 60% of what we're feeding a combination of forages, not all silage. But, uh, when we're feeding cows like that, it really needs to be quality forage and quality fibre. So important to get all these steps right because hay and silage are, are both biological processes that we have to manage. Uh, many people don't think that of hay, they think it's just dry, but there's a lot of biology happening in that hay making process as well. Just with silage, it happens in a much shorter period of time and pr can probably go wrong a lot quicker. One of those things is when we're dealing with crops like cereals, vetch, spring pastures, etc., we have to wilt those silages to get them to the correct moisture level or dry matter level, whichever scale we're working in, to make that silage. So typically in a spring silage, we've got to get 10 to 15 percent of that moisture out of the plant before we're putting it in the pit or the bale. And the longer it takes to get from that standing plant in the field to in the silage pit or in the bale, compacted in the absence of oxygen, the more room there is for losses. So a long, slow wilt lying on the ground for a couple of days instead of managing it and getting it wilted quickly and made into silage could be half a megajoule to a megajoule of energy lost. So pretty valuable stuff when it comes to animal production. Getting those steps not so right also increases the opportunity for undesirable bugs in there, including in hay, to have a negative impact. So it's, we can turn great feed into poor feed quite easily if we don't manage it well. I'm not going to go into all those things today, just a couple. Uh, so the first one being you know, managing that wilting process to make silage is important. Seasonal conditions get thrown up at us all the time. It's, we live in Australia and we love the weather. So when we get various things come at us, we continually need to reassess, you know, what is it that's affecting us? Is it too wet, too dry? Fungal issues, uh, adding more undesirable uh, compounds into the feed, too dry. What do we do if we can't get to the desired maturity for the crop we were targeting? Yeah, you know, how does frost impact the outcome? And so on. And 
And one of the key things with cereals is that green colour in the crop does not always equal moisture, especially in the tough times. It might look green and I think oh, I'll leave that for a day or so to wilt, but the crop may have actually already been at the correct dry matter to ensile while it was standing there. So it's probably the first big is that people need to understand plant moisture that they're dealing with on the day. The other common one is soil contamination. We need to think of all crops as being contaminated in some way. It's just the level that varies. And uh, soil is a big one and, and one that we should try and manage. So we don't want to be mowing dirt in it. We don't want to be raking dirt in it. In a drought, like the picture on the right, it's very hard to do anything without dirt getting in it. But uh, cutting height, as you can see by the number of butyric spores there, you would measure in a sample that's cut low to the ground where you've got soil contamination coming off the base of the plant. That's massive when it comes to, to manage a fermentation in a silage. But lifting the mower up a bit or not having the rake scratch the ground, etc., has a big impact on that outcome. Um, pretty extreme example there of a very bad mowing raking job, but uh, that really impacts on animal health uh, intakes which hence then impacts on production. They may not be sick or dying, but they just may not eat as much and you won't have as much production because you've contaminated the feed. So going back a step even further and Luke alluded to this, what is our target? Are we chasing a protein crop, an energy crop, just a, a good digestible palatable, palatable fibre source for our diet or is it just total tonnes? And uh, we need to have that plan before we even you know, move to the paddock. What is it we're tar targeting? How are we going to achieve that? So that crop selection, we're planting two crops in the one paddock. What's the companion animal, uh, companion animal, the companion planting type situation going to be? How are we going to select that in terms of soil, uh, weed burden and end, end product for the animal? And the, the total yield one doesn't necessarily have any of the first three in it if you just blow it out either. So we've got to take all those things into consideration because that's, you know, why are we doing this? Feeding animals. So what's, what's the animal's need? How are we going to feed it, harvest it, store it, et cetera? So we need to have that plan, whether it be on our own farm or whether it's the, the people that we hope to sell fodder to uh, and have some some idea of what the target is we want so that we can hit it and you know, plan A, plan B, et cetera, on, on what we're going to do with the crop. So just a, um, a bit more about vetch and cereal maturity and, and mixing in a little bit. Uh, so we do see a lot of vetch grown on its own. Uh, just depends where you are, climate, soil, et cetera, what you can achieve. Most commonly we see it with another plant in small volumes, and we know we can grow it with cereal oats, wheat, canola, etc. And as Shane mentioned, pretty much those combinations are all covered off in various sites within this group, in this project. Uh, Luke spoke a little bit about it, but the maturity of the, the plants that we put together, we don't want one plant being uh, fully mature, gone, done before the other ones had the opportunity to grow. Or, or one overshadowing the other so that we get the wrong result. So that's where that sowing rates of the, of the mixture is important to understand what works in a, each individual environment, location soil, and what that combination does to the forage that we produce for the animal, targeting that protein or targeting more of an energy source or whatever it may be. A couple of photos to give you an example. The photo on the left, uh, cereal is there, but it's just about to be overtaken by the vetch because the vetch is about to fire up and get going when I was there yesterday. So that will turn into a pretty good uh, dairy feed, high protein, pretty digestible, and a pretty good yield. Paddock on the right, the cereal has probably been a bit heavy, overtaken the vetch. Uh, the vetch is not going to win the race. So a lot of people would just value that as, an, as a cereal crop. They would just go, no, that's not what I'm, I'm looking for to buy today. That's 
just a cereal crop. So I'm only going to place a cereal uh, hay value on it, even though the, you know we've set out with a target of having vetch in there and it, it hasn't come through. Another couple of shots. Um, so here we've got a, a veg crop that's sown pretty heavily with cereal. There's like over 50 kilos of cereal in the, uh, particularly the one on the right. I know what was in it. Uh, that cereal and veg mix there with that heavy cereal in it, that's targeted to be cut, you know, early flowering while that cereal is still high protein, highly digestible. So that we're still chasing that uh, high protein crop and high digestibility. We're just not chasing the extra volume that could come with what the, what the veg could produce later on, because there's still a fair bit of growing on the veg. I'll show you a couple more examples of that as we go. So just to, to single out the cereal, the, um, on these, this graph here, it's got triticale and wheat on it, but it gives us a fairly good indication of how cereals perform through their, their life, where we start out with a pretty high protein. Let me see if I get the pointer working here. There we go. So high protein, early leafy plant. Protein starts to drop off as we get close to the boot stage pre-head emergence, but we've still got a fairly high protein, sorry, I'm on the wrong one, but high protein. But after that, as we go to flowering and grain fill, the protein is gonna to continue to drop away significantly. Meanwhile, our yield is going up, but also is our, so is our NDF, so our digestibility of that plant, what the animal can utilize from that plant is decreasing. So that's where the, with cereals, there's two opportunities to make good silage out of them. The first one is that food stage, free head emergence, high protein, highly digestible, good energy. And then right over here at the other stage where we've got some grain fill that we're using as an energy and a starch source. So that's go uh, milky, depending on the, on the type of cereal you've got. Now that's where the, if the cereals have, gone right through to this stage in our veg crop, they're really pulling down the, the quality of that veg crop in terms of digestibility and protein. We're pulling it down by just dilution uh, of that quantity. And also by increasing the NDF, it uh, pulls down the total NDF, it lowers, sorry, increases the total NDF of that as a feed. So harvest timing on vetch. So vetch can flower for a long time if it's got moisture available to it and it's not too hot. So we can get vetch that might continue to flower for two to three weeks in, in really good conditions. Or it's got plenty of water under it. And in that time, it can grow a lot of biomass. It doesn't necessarily drop very much protein at all. However, the cereal in there is, is going in the opposite direction. That's the bit we've got to manage. Uh, so you can, yeah, you can take that, that veg right through the, the full flowering conditions, allow, increase your yield, and still have a pretty high protein feed. Uh, you probably, whilst you're watching that, you probably will find some small pods that have started to develop, which you can't see until you look really hard because vetch can be doing everything at once. Once it starts flowering, it can start filling pods at the bottom as well and continue up its wild conditions are good. Uh, if we let it go too potted, again, like a cereal, the feed value starts to drop away. Uh, as I think Luke mentioned, can be part of a weed management thing, and we do see a lot more people uh, spraying crops and, and mowing them and before they do hay and silage. And here's a, a photo that I used just to give you an example of. It's pretty full flowered, but you can see the cereal in the windrow. The cereal that was underneath it for the framework is pretty much toast. So whilst we've got a high quality, reasonably high quality veg plant still there, the, dil the dilution of the cereal is going to pull that feed value down of the total feed. So it's not going to be as valuable 
and is productive to the farmer, regardless whether they're beef, sheep, dairy, or whatever. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's probably it to, for me. And to summarize probably those things was just choose the species and the mixture that's gonna work for you in your situation for your target market or your target use in animals. Harvest timing is when you lock in the feed value and the quality of the product. So by, you know, when you mow, that's the quality that you're gonna have. If you, if you mow at the right time, it's great. If you go too late, it's gonna be lower. Manage that silage system, you know, needs to be really well done to tick all the boxes and, and avoid losses and lowering that quality along the way to produce that, you know, high quality clean feed for animals. So that we have a, you know, we always go on about producing hygienic, clean feed, clean silage. This is such a big part of the dairy industry in particular to feed ruminants a lot of forage. It needs to be clean and high quality. And that's pretty much what I was going to add to the conversation without going into great details about making silage. So thank you, Jane. Thanks, David. Um, does anyone have any questions? For I guess um, in relation to the field site, um, there's a few things to note. So the demonstration site, um, one, it has a huge weed issue because it wasn't prepared properly. Um, and the vetch, obviously I said before, it was, um, the soil's a little bit acidic, which doesn't help the vetch. Um, we had two timing dates, one mid-April and one mid-May. Um, the one in April was dry um, and the one in May, it was sown and then it started raining and didn't stop. <laughs> Uh, the vetch we thought had not survived and then in the last three weeks when there was some sunshine it's started to poke its head up um, but now the oats are taking over um, and so I guess if if it was a commercial and you're a farmer I guess you would take it to hay um, because there's not much vetch in it. Uh, but yeah, so it was nice seeing some photos of some really good <laughs> crops there, David, <laughs> because having a look at the demonstration site, it didn't look like that. Um, there was a couple of sections where it did, but um, <laughs> as, we, as we said, we've run it as a demonstration site, so we know what we can show what to do and what not to do. Um, and some issues associated if you do just turn around and all of a sudden so some forage crops um, and what you need to think about. So David, we had a question in the chat. Is it better from a silage management perspective to grow cereals and vetch separately and mix at feeding? Yep, I was just gonna type the answer but I can talk quicker than talk. <laughs> um, often it is to have, you know, grow your protein in one paddock and grow your energy or your fibre source in a separate paddock and then if you're making up a diet, you can make what the animal requires in terms of protein and energy. You know, are we making milk or we've got actively growing young animals? What is it we need? Um, I get lots of questions about mixing crops all the time. Uh, people read stuff and it looks great on paper, but practicalities of trying to achieve it get very difficult. Uh, hence why we have trials like these ones we're doing all over the countryside to work out what suits in each area. Um, so yeah, certainly, to, and is it an option to consider because some plants that people try and put together just do not work together. It reduces that chemical uh, flexibility, management flexibility, which crop do we manage the, the hay or the silage to if we haven't got their maturities right and those sort of things. So sometimes it is, yeah, keep it separate. What are your thoughts on that, Luke? Right. In terms of um, yeah, in terms of separate crops, I think in growing straight cereal, the weed management options are greater. So if you've got a cape weed paddock, as I mentioned earlier, or straight wheat or straight oats, you've got so many more options to clean up. Uh, you just have to target the vetch into 
paddock's probably where you just got a grass issue so once you got straight vetch you got the option then to go in with grass selective herbicides it'll kill all cereals barley grass brown grass rye grass potentially silver grass so yeah there's some um, weed benefits by splitting the crop If our target is only to have the second crop there as a framework in the veg situation, it's really about just having it minimal and managing it to the veg if our, if our target is to grow veg. Jane, if there's no other questions, would you mind just having a crack at showing that video again? I will try. <laughs> okay, now I've had some... Um, hints from the crowd so <laughs> I will <laughs> try again might have to take off your headset yep I'm just <clears throat> and, and unplug it <laughs> And if I play this video, oh, that black that black box is back, hun. Do you want me to give it a try, Catherine? I've got it open. Yeah, that'll be great, Lise. If you can do yep. that. All right. You just have to stop sharing screen, Jana. I need you, Jane, to give me permission to share my screen. Jane, can you stop? She can't hear us. Hang on. Hi, hi. No, it's not. Can you unshare your screen? And Lisa's going to try and share it from her computer. Yeah. Sorry about this team, tech issues. Everybody's biggest nightmare when they're Sorry. facilitating. I can't. Jane, can you give permission for Lisa to um, lead the meeting? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Jane, you'll have to give permission for Lisa to lead the meeting. Yeah, and over I host. think she has. Yeah, no, I can't. Oh. Disabled for me. Oh. Must have disabled you. Is it working now? Yep. Ah, oh, should have just got Lisa. Can to you hear it? No. Yep. Oh yes. Oh. No. No. Can't hear the music. No. Hell. We just have to send a link around. Try to, if you try it again now with the sound right up. Oh, hang on. Yep, yep. Hi, I'm Jane McGuinness, a project officer at Riverine Plains. Today we're at the trial site for Fodder for the Future in Burman North. We have a demonstration site that has oats and vetch with two different sowing dates and two different sowing rates. So this paddock traditionally hasn't had much love. Uh, it's been a pasture paddock that's been used for sheep. It hasn't had much lime or gypsum thrown at it and it's had pastures sown into it. With that in mind, we've now gone and sown crops into it and probably without adequate weed control, which means that now we are seeing those weed issues emerge. The issue we have with a crop like oats and vetch and vetch in the mix means our weed control options are limited. 
So now we can't spray out these weeds without spraying out the vetch. We're really excited with this demonstration site that we have the ability to really show the effect of sowing date and sowing rate and all the issues and problems that we've had along the way. So we know that we've got weed issues. We know that at mid-August, there's a real difference in growth for the oats and the vetch in both timing and the rates. Therefore, when we do our cuts at the end, at silage and at hay cut time, it'll be interesting to see whether the early grown or the late grown has a difference in feed quality and therefore will be great information for the fodder users and the grain growers on when the optimum time is to cut for hay or silage. The exciting part about this project is that dairy farmers can learn from the grain growers if they're wanting to start producing fodder for themselves and the grain growers, if they form those relationships with the dairy farmers, they can have a guaranteed market at the end of it. With all our learnings from this year, we're really excited that this project, the Fodder for the Future project, is continuing for a number of years to come and we can build on our learnings. So if you'd like further information on the project or an update on results or what's happening for the rest of the season, you can go to the Murray Dairy website or the Riverine Plains website on the projects page. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> we got it to work. <laughs> so you could see there, you could really see the differences um, in the strips. Um, and then you could see how the other half of the paddock was underwater. So <laughs> um, does anybody have any other further questions for any presenters? Luke, did you want to just comment on Gib Acid quickly? for everybody? Yeah, so that question I've just answered there, gibberellic acid, which is originally coming out as pro-gib, it's, um, it helps it helps stand the vetch up. Uh, it's not registered in vetch, but it's just a natural occurring basic acid. So it's something that a lot of people seem to use, especially out West. Um, it, yeah, so it helps stand it up, helps try and minimise the disease in vets by increasing airflow and also assist in putting the mower through it because it's standing up a bit more off the ground. So pretty basic, but yeah, the, there's benefits for it and it's pretty cheap. It can go in with an early fungicide or even a grass spray if it's straight vetch um, or if it was in vetch and cereal, you could potentially use it. But the theory of the cereal is there to stand the vetch up like what the jib acid does when vetch is alone. So yeah, it's worth using when vetch is by itself. Great. Thanks, Luke. Now, if there's no further questions, um, I'd just really like to thank our presenters for today. A um, few technical glitches <laughs> by me. That's what we get for having everything virtual. Uh, and with a bit of luck next year, follow this project. Uh, we'll have results up on the Riverine Plains and Murray Dairy websites after Christmas in early in the new year for all our sites. And next year we'll be um, sowing another demonstration site. And if anyone has any ideas that they'd like to see within the photo um, industry, please let me know and we can see what we can do about making a demonstration out of them. So thank you presenters, thanks everyone for coming and I will be forwarding you uh, a link to the video, a link to the presentations and also the evaluation, if you could please fill the evaluation in. So thanks all, enjoy your day and we'll see you next time. Thanks Jane.